Um, so I will start, sorry about that. Um, and as an outline, I too like to think simply, um, and I'd like to basically talk about two categories. Uh, extra-intestinal manifestations associated with inflammatory bowel disease or active inflammation in the gut, and then a separate focus upon extra-intestinal manifestations associated with therapies. Um, the rationale behind this is I'm seeing more and more of these drug-induced reactions uh, that are extra-intestinal in our patients with inflammatory bowel disease, and we need a better understanding in how to manage these as well. So, sorry, there's a delay here. Um, so our first case is a 15-year-old um, uh, gentleman um, with rectosigmoid colonic Crohn's disease. He's currently maintained on methotrexate, um, and he presents with pain and a lesion on his leg. And this is a picture of the lesion. Quite clearly, you can see the violaceous border, the undermined effect. This is pyoderma. Uh, and pyoderma can be quite difficult uh, to manage. Uh, in the setting of this case, we'll talk about what the extra-intestinal manifestations are of IBD, and specifically um, data on the pediatric population, which are associated with activity, are there shared disease characteristics or genetics, and what are the treatments? And so these are uh, adult data that look at the prevalence of extra-intestinal manifestations. And Sandy very uh, eloquently talked to us about arthritis, the most prevalent uh, manifestation. As you look down this list, uh, erythema nodosum, pyoderma uh, certainly are there, but at a lower rate. And so while we don't see it with as much frequency, it is something that we do need to be aware of. When you look specifically at whether or not um, there is an association with, uh, with disease activity, as you can see here, as Sandy mentioned in this adult cohort, um, more prevalent among those with active disease, but I would like to point out that there is a, a reasonable number of patients who have inactive bowel disease. They're in luminal remission who do have uh, evidence of these manifestations, particularly as you can see here with pyoderma, fairly equal numbers amongst inactive and active uh, disease. And when you look by disease location, uh, the big place to look is the blue bars. You'll see that colonic activity, we have not yet elucidated this mechanism, but really seems across the board to be associated with all of these extra-intestinal manifestations, uh, this being in an adult cohort. Interestingly, we do have um, data in pediatric IBD. Uh, Sandy did mention this very nice uh, recently um, published study from the Swiss pediatric IBD cohort. Um, to, cut, to cut to the meat, because she did discuss it, um, we, you know, obviously uh, we see um, a good number of extra-intestinal manifestations in pediatric IBD. Many often predate uh, the development of um, the actual luminal disease. And when you compare this to the adult world, you can see these overall numbers are somewhat uh, lower um, than in the adult world. But um, particularly the ones that are starred, um, those seem to be significantly less frequent in um, pediatric IBD as compared to the adult world, uh, pre predominantly the joint manifestations. We see similar rates of um, pyoderma, and actually psoriasis is included here as well. And so, obviously, our case of pyoderma, this location on the leg is very typical. The other place I often see it is peristomally, um, and that can be very difficult to manage with adhesion of the uh, appliance, and obviously um, needs local as well as systemic treatment. The prevalence of pyoderma is about 2%, as you saw, um, in pediatric and adult populations. Um, the risk factors are exactly that um, colonic disease, uh, more extensive colitis, and female gender as well. The therapeutic options are diverse. And unfortunately, most of the data we have on pyoderma treatment are at the level of case series. Um, so obviously, one of our mainstays of therapy is steroids. Um, often, pyoderma is responsive to steroids. We often will use uh, intralesional um, kinolog injections as well. And you can inject along the lateral border of the lesion um, with some efficacy. Uh, in terms of the other um, options, I would say that anti-TNF therapy is really now the treatment of choice. And that's based off of the only randomized controlled trial data we have on the treatment of pyoderma. In this study um, uh, of infliximab for the treatment of pyoderma, individuals were randomized um, to treatment with infliximab or not, and then followed at two weeks, and they looked for improvement in the lesion. And then at two weeks, all were rolled over to open-label treatment with infliximab to assess responses. And as you can see here, there was a, a dramatic difference at week two in terms of improvement of the lesion, 46% on the infliximab group as compared to only 6% amongst placebo. And when these individuals um, were then followed out uh, for response rates uh, with the open label treatment, as you can see by this slide, one key aspect was the duration of the pyoderma. And so this is what I would encourage uh, is that 
this needs to be treated early in the course. If this is allowed to become chronic, it becomes less responsive to therapy up front. So if the pyoderma uh, duration was less than 12 weeks, as you can see here, uh, dramatically, erratic um, rates of improvement, whereas when you got to more chronic duration pyoderma, uh, less improvement with only 47%. And so a second case, a young teenager with uh, pancolitis maintained on 5-ASA, uh, no bowel symptoms, uh, and she presents with these lesions on her leg, which quite clearly represent uh, erythema nodosum. And so, again, we see some of those same clinical factors, uh, female gender, colonic disease, prior surgery, which seems to be obviously a more aggressive disease course. And if they have other non-cutaneous extraintestinal manifestations, we seem to see a higher prevalence of erythema nodosum. And there do seem to be some uh, genetic susceptibility genes that are associated with erythema nodosum, as listed here as well. When we think about treatment of erythema nodosum, um, corticosteroids are a mainstay of therapy. Other, th other treatment options, dapsone, cyclosporin, and certainly uh, disease-specific therapy, as this, if this is associated with increased luminal GI activity, you certainly want to target that as well, and often that will improve the erythema nodosum. So moving on, um, an, another teenager who has a history of colonic Crohn's disease, and she presented with a scaly, itchy rash on her uh, ears and scalp. No change in bowel movement frequency, and she'd been stable for many years on adalimumab, 40 milligrams every other week. And this is a picture of her rash, which clearly represents uh, psoriasis. And in up to 10% of cases of all psoriasis, it's associated with another inflammatory condition, uh, such as inflammatory bowel disease. And so this brings up the question of which extraintestinal manifestations are associated with therapies, and how do these therapy-induced EIMs commonly present, and what are the treatments? Uh, the, one of the main questions I'm often asked is whether the underlying medication needs to be stopped, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, for thiopurines, they can have hypersensitivity, uh, sweet syndrome. Um, methotrexate, you can have a macu maculopapular rash associated with uh, methotrexate, um, alopecia as well. With the anti-TNFs, certainly this immediate drug hypersensitivity reaction, infections are a possibility. Um, but the rashes that we do see um, most often are actually the psor psoriasiform eruptions. And so in, in newer literature, these reactions can occur in up to 10% of patients. So I'd be surprised. I'm sure everyone in this room has seen one of these psoriasiform eruptions at this point in a patient on an anti-TNF. And many of them are managed with topical therapy, and that's the first mainstay of treatment. But in several situations, they are, these, these psoriasis from eruptions do not respond, and you're left with a clinical dilemma, where often the, the treatment is very effective from a bowel standpoint, but you have this intolerable drug-induced extraintestinal manifestation that you need to address. Uh, changing class is an option, um, but actually an alternate anti-TNF can have a recurrence of the psoriasis from eruption in up to 50% of cases. And so, uh, again, any of these uh, various skin manifestations that occur associated with therapy uh, have ranged from estimates of two up to 29% in the literature. The incidence uh, is five per 100 person years, so this is something you will see if you have not. It's not limited to IBD, and we see it in other rheumatologic conditions, including RA. And I've seen it occur nearly immediately after initiation of the agent, but it often occurs uh, down the road when they're stable, when they're on more maintenance therapy. At this point, the only level of data we have are from various retrospective cohorts. And when you summarize the data from these cohorts, you'll see that um, you have an, uh, those that increase the risk of these skin lesions are smoking, uh, if we need yet another reason for teenagers not to smoke and, and smoke into adulthood. Crohn's disease, potentially higher doses of anti-TNF agents. Uh, there have been a couple of smaller studies that have demonstrated this association. The largest study to date in the adult population did not see an association with trough levels of infliximab at least. A higher BMI and, and female gender. We seem to see a less effect when someone is on a concomitant immunomodulator and in those that have ulcerative colitis as compared to Crohn's disease. And so the majority, again, are managed with conservative therapy. And you can see up to nearly 90% efficacy with these topical treatments. But when patients discontinue, often it's related to the location on their face or neck, a very obvious uh, location that does not resolve, itching, pain, recurring symptoms, or even associated arthralgias, uh, as Sandy mentioned, that can be associated with uh, almost uh, like a psoriatic arthritis. So after stopping an anti-TNF, the majority will resolve, but not all. 
And there have been case reports of uh, use of ustekinumab, clearly an IL-1223 inhibitor now approved in Crohn's disease in adults, that is also approved in psoriasis, and it has an excellent response rate. Some of the genetic studies of this particular psoriasiform eruption have linked it to the IL-23 receptor, and so that may be one reason why uh, ustekinumab seems to be quite effective in this population. And so when you think about how to manage it, the first step, Am I pointing in the wrong spot? <laughs> there we go. The first step is to confirm the diagnosis and communicate with the dermatologist. Uh, smoking cessation, if they're a smoker. Um, add uh, conventional treatments. And I will add an immunomodulator. Uh, methotrexate can be quite uh, effective in this scenario if it's, they're not already on it. If they improve, I continue that course of action. If they don't, I ask myself, how are they doing on that TNF? If they were doing quite well from a bowel standpoint, then I would consider an alternate anti-TNF because only up to 50% of recurrence occurs with an alternate formulation. If they weren't doing that well, they had continued symptoms, this would be a consideration of use of ustekinumab, which clearly we know is not yet approved in the pediatric world, but something that could be potentially used off-label for both the psoriasis and the uh, underlying Crohn's disease. So last case, a 14-year-old um, young woman who uh, had been in remission, uh, and, I, and no, I noticed an incidental skin lesion um, on her abdominal wall. And clearly, this is a, a melanoma, increasing in incidence, and something that uh, we as gastroenterologists are not necessarily as used to looking for and evaluating, but certainly something that we see, particularly in the young adult population, and one of the main risk factors is immunosuppression. And so this was a study we did um, that actually included um, pediatric and adult patients uh, where we looked at the incidence of melanoma in inflammatory bowel disease. And as you can see here, there's an increased incidence rate ratio of about 1.5 for development of melanoma. And actually this increase persisted across strata. So this also effect is seen in younger people and young adults uh, and late age teenagers as well. And when we looked specifically at the medications used for the treatment um, of Crohn's disease, as you can see here, it seems to be the biologics, the anti-TNFs that increase this risk. We don't know the mechanism of action for this. We think for non-melanoma skin cancer, which clearly you don't see as much in pediatric populations, but with cumulative azathioprine dosing, we see an increased risk in adults. That mechanism seems to be photosensitivity. We don't yet know the mechanism associated with uh, the anti-TNFs for the development of melanoma. And so really starting early, uh, I can't emphasize this enough, enough, particularly patients that will be placed on thiopurines, uh, really uh, primary prevention, recommending sunscreen use, and then considering secondary prevention, particularly in patients with other risk factors uh, for development of skin cancer. While annual examinations are not recommended even in the adult population, we certainly, they are recommended in transplant populations with high levels of immunosuppression, and it's something that should be considered, and certainly referral for any suspicious lesion. And so finally, my last slide, for pyoderma, anti-TNF is the treatment of choice. Consider intralesional steroid injections. Those can be quite effective for local management. Uh, erythemonodosum responds to uh, corticosteroids uh, for the most part, uh, adjusting their underlying main medical therapy. And for anti-TNF-induced psoriasis of the scalp, really think about those topical agents, but recognize that we now may have another option in refractory cases that continue on anti-TNFs and thinking about ustekinumab. And in case four with melanoma, a resection, staging, recommend sunscreen use. And given the data we have on the TNF increasing the risk of this lesion, we may want to consider if another alternate uh, mechanism of action is available, uh, maintaining them on something else, depending on the independent characteristics of their melanoma. Thank you.